have a very old um, late 1800s Waltham pocket watch. It's uh, from my friend Alan, um, and it's got a key fob, as you can see, a keychain fob. It says R on it. So his last name doesn't start with R, but it says R. Perhaps it was owned by a pirate at one time. So in this picture, you can see in the upper right hand corner, um, I've included a high def camera. It's just like a uh, very small uh, image of, of what I'm doing as I'm reassembling this uh, pocket watch. So I've got this uh, watch in my uh, my cleaning basket. As you can see, I've got the hands just resting there on the uh, on the top. Um, I usually I usually take the hands and I and I put them aside and I, and I put them on the crystal. Um, and just on the inside to keep them separated from everyone, everything else. Um, and I've got uh, the cleaning basket here. Um, it's an aluminum cleaning basket. It comes with the pearl watch cleaning machine that I that I use or have been using for a little while now. Um, and the baskets, there's three levels of baskets here. So right now I'm just removing the, uh, the top level of the baskets. Um, and there's a screen that you put on the top, sort of a cover to the basket. And that goes on the top of the uh, of the, the first basket, and in there I've got parts separated, and I try to keep the screws uh, with the parts, so I know which screw goes with uh, which part. Um, and I just have a look at the uh, the overall condition of the part as it comes out. It looks pretty clean, con considering how the uh, parts looked when I put them in the basket. So this is an excellent way of cleaning the pocket watch. Um, I've got a couple of cleaning solutions and rinsing solutions and as you've seen in a previous video when I use my when I use my uh, pearl uh, watch cleaning machine I typically would take this uh, I would typically use one cleaning and and uh, two rinses to do this now you can also um, use Rodico on these parts afterward as you can see on the top of the uh, the mainspring barrel cover it looks like there's a little bit of uh, scratching there. Um, I don't think it's dirt. I think it's just scratching left over. So I'm just carefully removing the parts from this particular basket. One of my main concerns here with using this basket was that the top lid would stay on. And when you when you clip this the overall basket frame onto the pearl machine, um, it's got some springs in the top that they're like uh, leaf springs that push down on that top lid to make sure that that lid stays down where it's supposed to be. So I'm just pulling the center wheel out there and having a quick look at it. And then I'm flipping the basket over and stomping it down just to make sure there's no residual parts uh, left over in the basket. And that's that basket. Now you can see the second layer of basket. I've got these little mini baskets. I bought them from uh, CousinsUK.com. Uh, very reputable watch uh, parts and tools store. Um, they do watch parts. They also do pocket watch parts. Um, they you can get crystals from that that uh, company. You can get uh, mainsprings. I buy my mainsprings from Cousins uh, UK. They've got a really good uh, web page that lets you uh, pick the right uh, strength and length and and width of that mainspring. So um, very good store to go to. These baskets are in there pretty snug. Uh, I find that using one of my bigger screwdrivers just to wedge it in the crack and twist it gets that basket lid open um, and I'm dumping the uh, the individual baskets and parts and then having a look at the basket itself. Um, I've got one glove on today just to try to keep the uh, keep my fingers away from the uh, parts as much as I can. Uh, it's kind of difficult to work with a glove on um, but you get used to it. Uh, I know that I've seen uh, videos on YouTube of the old days when the old guys used to do pocket watch work and repair and uh, they would not wear gloves so so it's a fallacy I think that say that uh, all the watch companies back in the day had watchmakers that had gloves on so they didn't I saw these old videos and guys sitting at the bench doing pocket watch work and there were no glo no gloves at all on so it's a big uh, big difference in what what is what uh, you think And again, I'm looking at the uh, screws and the parts, and I think at this point in time, I was kind of very um, concerned that uh, it looked like there were some screws missing, um, but in fact there weren't. Um, these, some of these parts, the part on the lower 
um, right hand side there that's next to the screw that part just sits uh, on top of a post uh, on the movement on the lower end of the uh, movement so it doesn't require a screw it's just sitting there um, and it's covered by the mainspring barrel uh, so it's no problem and again if you look in the upper right hand side of the video again I've got this uh, high definition uh, full HD uh, 1080p camera that I'm using to uh, to shoot uh, my mat as I'm doing the work and uh, <coughs> and I am organizing all the parts on the mat so contrary to popular belief I don't just take these parts out and dump them um, I organize them um, after I've done the work and I put them back so I can uh, when I reassemble the watch, it's not difficult to find which screws go with which plates. So everything looks pretty darn clean, as you can see, and there's nothing left in the uh, in the watch basket. Um, although I am looking at it very closely with my loop, just to make sure that uh, there isn't anything left in the baskets. I put the small baskets back because I'm going to reuse this um, this whole the baskets um, um, in a in the near term for uh, cleaning another uh, pocket watch that I'm working on. Now I haven't been cleaning watches with um, the Pearl watch cleaning machine uh, for a long time. I bought the machine about uh, two months ago and I've used it uh, probably around four times now to clean uh, watches and it does a pretty amazing job. You got to keep an eye on it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend letting it run and then assuming that everything is fine and going somewhere and doing something but it's set with a timer uh, so you you can do that, but I wouldn't recommend it. So here are the lower basket. Um, I put in the main plates, and I also put in the mainspring into the lower basket as well. And that way, I've got the uh, the um, all the main plates in here are not going to cause an issue being grouped together. And the mainspring, uh, putting the mainspring in, gives me the opportunity to clean that mainspring nicely as I uh, you know get the part get ready for the reassembly of the watch. And now I'm just restacking the uh, the baskets, uh, getting ready for the next job. Uh, it's a pretty cool machine, I think. Uh, it's uh, run you about a thousand bucks, uh, and it comes from uh, India. You just have to make sure when you buy this machine that you get the right plug. Uh, it came with a European, or came from an Indian plug, which is the three round posts, and I just cut the plug off, and I put a North American three prong on there so here I'm looking at the uh, center wheel it seems to have some kind of a JB weld or something on it that I didn't notice before I'm not sure what that is um, but I'm not going to play with it it may have been staked on to that to the uh, to the shaft and then someone might have put some JB weld or some glue or something on there but I'm not going to play with that it seems to be pretty solid I'm also looking at the screws and making sure I've got the right uh, amount of screws remaining. At this point in time I was a bit concerned with the number of screws and the number of holes I'm looking at. So it's uh, if you're a golfer and you're looking at you're on the green and you find two golf holes then uh, you know that's not good but you can probably putt at either one. But if you find no golf holes then you get big problems. That was a very bad analogy for finding screws. Anyway so I'm looking at the parts again and uh, trying to figure out whether I'm missing any screws or not. So I determined that I wasn't, so I figured I'd just start the reassembly and like get her done, get on with it. And here we've got the main plate, it's very clean. Uh, this uh, watch cleaning machine has done an exceptional job. And on the upper right you can see me with my iPhone. Um, I've got a photo of, of these springs to make sure I put them back in the right place. Um, I could replay my disassembly video because I think I made one, but uh, it's better just to take a couple of shots of the uh, of the parts. I think in classic watchmaking, before they had iPhones, they would write this material down on a notepad, and they would note what part they have and where it goes. I know from uh, a local clock collectors group that they, in fact, uh, they in fact do that when they disassemble a clock and they mark it and they mark all of the parts and they kind of order the parts in a basket. Some folks use um, egg crates because these are watch or clock parts which are a lot bigger. So I've tightened the uh, screw on that spring and I'm just testing the spring a bit. So these springs, when you, if you break them, you got to make a new one. So it's 
not an easy job. You're likely using the f files to do that. Uh, so be very careful with these springs so you don't break them. Uh, they're very old too, so I imagine the metal is uh, not like it used to be. So, so here I've got. Um, I think this is a this is a mainspring uh, release. So when you're releasing tension uh, from the mainspring on this particular pocket watch, you push on that that the end of that small lever uh, with a toothpick, um, uh, and then that actually disengages it's a click spring for the mainspring so it disengages the ratchet on the bottom so you'll see me put the ratchet wheel um into that it's, it's basically the same size as the uh as the lower end of the mainspring and the lower end of the mainspring is actually the upper end if you look at the mainspring barrel and the cap so the cap jewel or the cap of the mainspring goes downward into that hole and it goes downward um, and the arbor has got a square post on it and the square post goes into a square hole that's part of part of uh, that uh, uh, the wheel that's on the bottom there that's uh, used the ratchet wheel that's used to actually um, hold the arbor in place so uh, you'll see this come together a little bit later so so here was the um, one of the harder parts of reassembling this whole watch was all of the uh, all the springs and, and levers that were used to uh, to address uh, the setting mechanisms and winding mechanisms for this old pocket watch. And here I'm just um, putting one of the uh, springs back into place. Here, this is an interesting spring. It's a almost a full circle, very thin. Uh, metal going around so they would have to uh, temper that spring specifically for the amount of springiness that they need if I were to break that spring in particular I don't know if I'd be able to make one uh, exactly like this that's why in when you're working on these vintage pocket watches um, I did it I took it apart this time but it's probably not a great idea to re be removing these old springs from the vintage pocket watches you can damage them um, fairly easily uh, if you if if they're maybe moved around the basket wrong or there's a heavier part near it or something like that when you're cleaning it so I made sure that they were separated properly and that they uh, didn't have any heavier parts near them but but it does scare the crap out of me when I put these springs take these springs off and stuff so I would recommend that if the uh, setting mechanism is working perfectly that you can probably throw the whole darn thing in with the plate into the cleaning machine and then dry it after um, it, you, it goes through the dryer part of the cleaning machine but you can also use a a hair dryer after just to make sure that all the moisture is away from the setting mechanisms and you usually can get under there with uh, an oiler to provide some lubrication to the setting mechanisms um, I tend to lubricate the setting mechanism where the metal parts touch another metal part. So as a, in this case here, if I'm reinstalling um, this lever here that's uh, used, it's sprung on, the, on one side, but this lever actually interacts with the, uh, the part the, on the lower part of the plate. And, uh, and I would oil uh, the part where that lever is touching, the, uh, that spring. Um, I can't remember whether I did this or not, but because uh, I'm overdubbing this video right now, as I was uh, concentrating my butt off to try to put this watch back together again, um, I had to. I decided to just not do any audio and then overdub it, uh, dub it later. So, so here I'm pressing the spring in place and and making sure it's uh, yeah properly set. So here I, I I I have to get two screwdrivers to do this job. So um, the black part of that other screwdriver, by the way, is, is, is burnt shellac. So I was using this specific screwdriver when I was uh, doing some shellac work on a jewel setting. And it, the shellac just spilled onto that. Uh, I said screwdriver, I meant tweezers. Sorry about that, folks. But it was the burnt shellac on the end of those brass tweezers. I could sand that off. I did sand it a bit so I could hold them, but I, I used that s that set of tweezers as, as an auxiliary set. So, so here I've um, put in the uh, stem work here, and I'm 
put some uh, Rodico in the top to hold that in place while I look at the other side because um, at this point in in uh, reassembly of the uh, pocket watch uh, I did not want these parts to fall out again so I just uh, put some Rodico in the top which usually works well and just flip that plate around um, Rodico is the watchmaker's best friend you could probably use it for other things too but really good for watchmaking So here I'm just putting it into my number 58 Myers number 58 movement holder. I think I put a note on line there that this is, I would say, the best movement holder out there. Um, the top part kind of came out a bit, but uh, there's all kinds of sizes of that top part. So the the main um, feature of this movement holder is that um, it provides extreme stability of the uh, of the plate when you're working on a pocket watch or the overall pocket watch. As you can see the width of that uh, of the two uh, kind of half moons in that move movement holder, the mouse and the movement holder are great for grabbing the uh, the plate um, and as well they have those little those little uh, shark mouth uh, on the on the end of each one of those half moons that actually aid in in grabbing that plate as well. So. Uh, so this is a, a larger surface area, so you can push down on that uh, on that movement. It's not going to flip on you, um, and it comes with the whole different uh, all the different sizes of uh, of these uh, little holders that uh, for, for if you're working on anything from a very small uh, ladies uh, watch uh, or men's watch to right up to these big pocket watches. This pocket watch is a round a size. 12, I think it's a size 14 um, Waltham, I think they said, which is an odd size, but it's a size 14 Waltham. Um, and the movement holder works really well. So here I'm looking at the uh, the wheels. I'm trying to make sure that the um, there's there's sometimes they have the bevel on one side of the wheel, uh, the, the actual teeth on that gear wheel um, are beveled slightly. Usually the beveled surface is the surface touching uh, the metal on one side, so I would say and it's the most abrasive metal that they'd have the beveled side so in this case here I've got um, the 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 pot the bevel there was no bevel in this case on this uh, on these two gears here I looked very closely to see if there are any bevels so I would have probably faced those uh, bevels um, upward as opposed to downward if there were bevels um, only because the, uh, the of the metal plate um, the, the steel plate that goes on top of of this particular um, configuration here. So, so I play with this for a little bit of time um, and to try to get this in place. Um, at the end of the day, what I ended up doing, just so you don't get bored uh, to death, is I is I took the, um, the the plate and put it on top, and I turned the whole mechanism upside down. So what I did was I took the wheels the small wheels that you see and I place the wheels on the plate um, and then I turn the whole thing upside down with the plate having the wheels on it and just pushed it on top of where it needs to go upside down so I use gravity as my friend here there's a very small spring that I'm moving out of the way um, and this spring actually works in court in conjunction with the plate itself to make this the whole unit uh, uh, twist uh, left and right so or rotate left and right and you'll see how that works a little later on in the video so in the interest of time I decided to speed this video up uh, times four so you wouldn't uh, get incredibly bored by watching me reassemble this particular part of the watch um, I'm oiling around the very small uh, studs that are part of that upper plate, as you can see, um, and just to make sure that there's some lubrication where those wheels are spinning. Um, that the wheel that's closest to you, the small wheel closest to you, and the large wheel are both steel, so it's steel on steel. So I want to make sure that those wheels are are, are proper properly lubed. Um, the posts are lubed properly. The other the wheels are not steel, so so uh, 
we're looking at uh, less uh, less concern over friction. So here I'm trying to get that small plate with the two screws in place. This was so difficult. Um, I think I ended up taking off my glove because of how difficult it was. Normally you would do what I'm doing right now, which is put one screw in, try to get that in place, and then jog the wheels around to uh, to make sure the thing is uh, actually working properly. Um, but as I said earlier, I did this. I, I uh, pardon my French, but I farted with this for quite a while until I got it in... Uh, uh, figured out I had to do this thing upside down because those wheels just kept moving because um, I had the two screws to put in plus I had that that metal guitar st like spring that was kind of stuck underneath I kept having to move that out of the way um, and then put that in place here I'm trying to do it the other way configure it the other way and eventually I gave up and said just put the wheels onto that upper plate turn it upside down and then uh, and then put it in configuration so you'll see that happening so there we go. So there it is. Uh, that's one side of the plate. And I'm going to flip that around and show you the other side of the plate. So there we go. So now that's that's in place right now. Um, that's a kind of a nice zoom on my new camera, as you can see, right? So, so that worked well. Um, I was almost suicidal uh, do working on that for a while. I was like, this is annoying as heck. Here I'm uh, putting uh, this the main post here. Um, inside of the uh, setting mechanism. So that would be the crown wheel, or I can't remember what it's called. i got to look up in my book again and see what the thing is called. Anyway, or ratchet, actually. I think it's the ratchet. Um, anyway, that, that uh, little pusher that I put inside, it uh, when you push in the pocket watch, um, it's used for uh, winding. So in its natural position, with the crown pushed down, that little post would be pushed uh, pushed out, which would actually push the uh, setting mechanisms to uh, to go into the winding mode and, and not the setting mode. So when you pull the crown out on this pocket watch, you're setting the, the time on the pocket watch. So I put that in there uh, nice and carefully, and I'm also going to um, oil that as well, put some lubrication there as well, as you can see too much oil on the end of those posts because the um, the oil can or lubrication can wander and if it wanders around it could wander around the wrong place in the uh, pocket watch and might affect it so this location is not near the uh, where the uh, the hairspring would be so I'm not concerned about oil getting on the hairspring here um, over time the older oils would would gum up a lot um, and I think over time the synthetic oils just simply disappear as opposed to get getting gummy. I, th I read that somewhere. Uh, so, and they were saying that for old pocket watches that use the old, the old uh, animal oil, I believe it was, um, the, uh, there was a value behind this because they, they would gum up and your watch would, uh, your watch would not perform properly and it kind of gave you an indication that you needed to get it serviced and and re-oiled. So in the new newer oils that they have, there really is no indication that you need to get it serviced because the oil will just evaporate, disappear after a period of time. It wouldn't, wouldn't it won't gum up or change its consistency because it's synthetic as much as the old oil would. So the, then you wouldn't know that your watch uh, needed servicing if you forgot all about it, your watch or your pocket watch. Um, and then you could be running a watch with uh, with no oil and the jewels inside, you know, protecting the or reducing the friction between the pivot and the, and the inside of that jewel um, or the cap jewel that's on top. So, and when you're oiling a watch and it's got a cap jewel, you're oiling the cap and then turning that around so that the uh, the uh, the the very tip of that pivot, the end of that pivot, is touching the cap jewel. So that's called end shake is the distance that you would have between the end of that pivot and the capsule. So here I'm just putting the wheels back in um, one at a time. I try to grab the wheels very gently so I'm not bending anything. So I'm holding those tweezers extremely gently so nothing is getting um, moved around or, or anything as I do this. So this is the center wheel going in. So the uh, wheel configuration on this watch is pretty simple. 
Some watches that are full plate watches are very difficult. Uh, if they have a different kind of uh, pallet fork, not your standard pallet fork that you see now, um, uh, it makes it very difficult to reassemble the very old ones from like the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, those ones were a big pain in the butt uh, to reassemble and you're tweaking the, uh, the wheels forever. Um, and in this case, I actually use Rodico uh, to hold the, uh, the pallet fork in place in the older ones. This one here, I don't have to do that. So I just have to make sure it's all in place. Here I've elected to uh, put the main plate on um, and I'll put the pallet fork in later. So you have to have the, um, the, the main spring has got to be in, conf in inside the watch before you put that plate on. Here I'm showing you the barrel and the main spring. Um, and most watches that are like uh, three-quarter plate or this is a, I would consider a full plate watch but because it's not really it's it's covering everything so that's maybe it's a three-quarter plate but your typical or traditional half plate watch or whatever would allow you to re remove that mainspring and replace it without having to to take the uh, the whole plate apart so so here I've got the mainspring um, and the barrel, and now I've got to decide which way this mainspring goes. It's good to take a photograph of the mainspring um, as it's sitting in the barrel before you take it out, just so you remember whether it goes uh, spirals clockwise or counterclockwise when it goes in. Uh, but if you don't remember, uh, what you need to do then is take the arbor and put the arbor into the barrel uh, the way the arbor would fit in the barrel and it usually only goes one way you can't flip the arbor around here I'm applying a little bit of oil to the inside of that uh, barrel to reduce the, uh, the friction so I've got four spots on the barrel cover on the inside that I'm, re that I'm putting oil and I also put oil just a slight bit of oil around that small hole uh, in the middle to make sure there's a uh, uh, less friction with the uh, the arbor when it goes in place so and this uh, s video here, you can see me putting in the uh, that wheel I told you about. That's uh, basically a ratchet wheel for the mainspring, and the arbor, the square part of the arbor pushes through that. So all I had to do is kind of move that the clicks the click away. So there's a click and a click spring that I had reassembled before. So I moved that click out of the way, and and then put that in place. And now I'm kind of trying to figure out, okay, which way does this mainspring uh, go clockwise or counterclockwise well through much uh, dissertation and thinking I th decided to kind of reassemble the thing um, and that is the mainspring reassembled uh, there we go there and that's the mainspring barrel reassembled um, with the cap on the other side I'm saying okay now the spring has to go a certain way so if I put this barrel in with the square part of the arbor going downward um, the uh, square arbor would go into that, that ratchet wheel I think it might be called um, then the spring has to go a certain way now the whole thing here is I want to make sure that when I wind the spring into the barrel using my spring winder that I don't wind it in the wrong way now, admittedly I've done that before um, but it was many, many years ago that I learned how not to do that. Because if you do that, um, you're putting it in and it's going in the wrong way and it won't work. There's a hook on the, uh, on the arbor and the arbor will hook onto the inside of that uh, mainspring and then pull, draw that, the in inner part of the mainspring inward, which tightens the mainspring as it's being wound. So here I'm looking at the uh, mainspring and grabbing that probably should use my gloves there but uh, it's not going to really affect it that much it's uh, not an aesthetic thing and I don't think there's going to be a problem there so I'm putting that down like that um, I bring out a uh, bench uh, a small block later on cause to allow that arbor to fall through and I'm just doing uh, this, some mental gymnastics here and thinking okay if this goes this way then that goes that way then this might go this way but if it doesn't go that way then it probably goes this way but it, whether it goes this way or that way, I have to make sure it's the right way. Hopefully you followed all that. So I've got the, uh, figured out how to do it. And now I've got to set up the mainspring uh, winder. And in this video, I actually show you uh, me winding the mainspring in, which is uh, something I haven't done in any other uh, video. 
I do this by hand as well, by the way. So here we have an old mainspring winder. I've selected the right uh, winder on the end, the end unit on the end. So I've uh, I basically have to f select that long um, shafted uh, spinning mechanism there, turning mechanism. I don't have a name for that. I have to select the right one that has got the right pin on it that will go inside of the of the opening uh, that 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 is where the mainspring arbor hooks in. So I've got to hook that pin in with this as well, and I'm just trying to do that right now. Um, one thing I didn't do, which I should have, was to tighten that bottom screw there, which would have kept that mechanism. Uh, nicely tightened and it wouldn't be rocking around like it is right now. So I haven't used this uh, mainspring winder for a while. I usually wind the mainsprings in by hand, but I did read somewhere that uh, you can have the potential of coning the mainspring if you wind it in by hand. So I'm being a good boy now and I'm actually uh, winding this, these in with a mainspring winder as opposed to doing it by hand. So, which I would say is a more professional way of doing it. Although I've seen professionals put the mainsprings in by hand. This is not for watches, of course. You have to use a mainspring winder for the watches. Watch barrels, because they're so small, it's be very difficult to to put one in, to uh, put a mainspring into the barrel by hand. So I'm just farting around with this here and trying to get this put in place. Now, here I've got it hooked nicely, but I'm pushing down with my uh, finger to make sure it stays hooked. So I'm reeling that mainspring in place. Um, and I've got, uh, I'm going to get to the end of it where the T-bar the is. As you can see, there's a T on the end of that mainspring. And that T, uh, the pivot ends of that T fit into the upper and lower part of the barrel. So the mainspring barrel and the lid, which uh, holds that mainspring in place. So I actually like these, uh, the old T mainsprings because you knew the darn thing was connected really well. And you weren't, uh, you didn't have problems. So here what I tried to do is reel the whole thing in. There's a little tiny opening in that in that uh, that barrel that you see on the far left uh, that where you wind the mainspring in. <coughs> There's a slight opening there that uh, where that the T usually fits outside of that barrel. In this case I wound it into the barrel hoping I could put the mainspring barrel over the top of that other barrel and the T would line up perfectly. But what ended up happening is that there was it was just inward just a bit too much to connect so I ended up just winding the mainspring a little bit more which slid that T around uh, the circle until it until it popped out of the small opening so the small opening is about 10 degrees of that overall uh, lid or barrel device for the winder that you see on the far left uh, I apologize for not showing that but so here I'm tightening the uh, the actual making sure this thing is tight, uh, tightening the uh, that barrel inside so it doesn't move around. Um, there's also a, a little a, a, a sleeve or I think a sleeve with a screw on it, a uh, locking collar I'll call it. So that's on sort of one inch in from that from where the mainspring. See there you can see the mainspring in there and if you look hard left you'll see the T that's inside the uh, the barrel and you'll see the little slice just up from there and that didn't work because it was too far in so I had to really like screw that or turn that again to have that thing pop out so I turned my uh, mainspring uh, winder at an angle just so you could see this on the video so if you're doing it uh, yourself you're not playing with uh, trying to make sure things in the video look good you're just doing it which probably is a little less nerve-wracking but uh, I do enjoy showing people uh, the trials and tribulations of doing uh, pocket watch work so uh, and doing it correctly so here I'm trying to get that little T lined up with the hole in the barrel and I'm having no success at all so I've decided here to wind that mainspring around again so the T pops out of this of that 10 degree slice that's in that lid so I did it properly there and now I've got to push the uh, the mainspring in so there's the thumb up uh, you know you get to do the job, I give you the tum. The tum means, so here you you wind the mainspring lever the opposite direction and it'll pop out of that uh, of the hook. 
and that just relieves it from the hook. And I make sure everything is very tight here because I'm just going to use my thumb and push the back of that. I didn't realize that, that you can't really see that, but I'm going to, no, I got to use my finger here. So I just have to push this inward and that'll pop the mainspring into the barrel. So we have a mainspring and a barrel right there. And as you can see in a second, uh, the little hole that I have there, that's where the T is popping through. So it's, I would say, a very successful job. Now here's another close-up, as you can see, of the T. Um, I'm getting used to my camera to, to see if I can do close-ups. I think if I put my hand there or you put your glove in the way, it zooms properly. So you can uh, just move it to the side a bit or something like that. And then you get the zoom on that angle. So, so there it is. Um, I didn't compress or close close in the, the center part that goes around the arbor. Um, I might, I probably should have because it, it isn't, it's hooking now, uh, but it's not a really solid hook on there, I think. So there is a chance if the, uh, if the mainspring is uh, completely let go that the arbor hook might not hook. It's very, very small chance because as I wind it in, it actually uh, compresses that circle again as well. So it's, it's not a bad, bad thing. So here we're going to do some, uh, oiling of the mainspring. So again, I take four spots on the mainspring and, and put a little bit of oil that will travel through that mainspring. You don't have to do that with new mainsprings now because they're, uh, they're not the same kind of metal that you'd have in the old days. So, uh, but in the old, with these old mainsprings, it's recommended you put some oil in there to allow the mainsprings to, to be loose or relieve themselves as they uh, go around in the circle. So in the interest of time, I've sped this uh, video up a bit here. So all I'm doing here is putting the arbor in. Um, in the hole here, as I said earlier, I use this little K and D block here and let the arbor drop through and then hook that into the mainspring and make sure that's hooked. Um, and then I uh, put the cap back on, uh, making sure the first thing I do to put the cap on is I make sure that the T part of the end of the mainspring is lined up with that little tiny groove on the cap, on the barrel cap. There's two openings. One opening is actually for you to put your screwdriver in um, to actually pop the barrel out. The other opening is uh, for the T. I also oiled near the hole where the, the arbor would be rubbing against the top of that uh, uh, barrel cap. So here it is. So I push that on now. Line that up perfectly. And I grab that with my fingers and pop it on. Then I use a screwdriver blade to uh, just pop it on and go around in a circle. So, but I did that pretty fast. So here we've got the mainspring now. I'm just going to slide that in place. So here I've got to have that square part of the arbor line up with that, uh, I'll say it's a ratchet gear, or ratchet wheel, whatever that is on the bottom there. So I want that to line up. So you can slide that in um, and what you can do to to make that happen is actually take a uh, take um, a bench key, stick the bench key into the winding mechanism, right? And when you're winding the watch, you're pushing it in. So I'd have to push that in, and that should turn that ratchet wheel on the bottom. And by turning that ratchet wheel, it's going to find square up with the square part of the end of that arbor, which will allow the mainspring barrel to fall into place. Now I don't have the cap on here, so I'm just putting my finger over that uh, old crown wheel or whatever the heck it's called there for the winding mechanism. And they probably have a different name because this is an old 1800s watch. So this managed to find home. Um, and now it's a matter of uh, putting this full plate back on which can be tricky, but this wasn't too bad in this situation. Um, but before I do that, I'm oiling, I'm going to oil that uh, crown wheel um, and put a little oil on the gears, put a little oil on that uh, lever that I talked about earlier, and I'm oiling where it's pressing. And then I'm also putting a little oil on the side of the, of the, uh, of the center wheel, and I'm putting a little oil on the arbor, uh, the top of the arbor for the mainspring that'll go through the hole on the plate and I'm putting a little bit of oil on the pivot for the uh, 
fourth wheel, third wheel, and the other wheels. So, so I'm oiling these on the inside because that's where the uh, pressure will be is the uh, pivots leaning against the inside of the hole, uh, each one of the holes on the plate. So that's where all the pressure is. So now I just have to line it up. A good trick to line this up is to find out where the groove is for that uh, for that crown wheel for the winding mechanism, and that's and then everything else will lined up nicely. So, so as I, I use that little curved tool I got from a, a shop there, a hobby shop that uh, is really good for getting in there. If it's a straight tool, it's not as good. This curved tool allows me to get in there and just sort of tweak the pivots. Um, and one technique I use that I think is really cool is that I put one screw in really loosely and that ensures that my plate actually stays in. And as you can see, I'm putting it in and I'm backing it off and putting it in and backing it off just to make sure that screw is not tight. And you can see I'm playing with it here, just showing you that it, it is not tight. And now I can pick this movement up um, out of the movement holder, hold it and then tweak those wheels on the top uh, just to make sure to get them all in place. So that's what I did. And now the wheels are in place. After you've put all the wheels in place, you can do what I'm doing here is just touching that center wheel a bit and spinning it. Um, I don't want to do this too much because if I spin it the wrong way, it could, it's, it's attached to the arbor on the mainspring. So it actually could take the mainspring off of that arbor, off of the hook on the arbor. So you don't want to do that too much, just a little tiny push and I was watching the escapement spin. Also look at the pivots on each one of those holes or look at each one of the holes where the jewel might be. And these, this is a non, like it's a seven jewel watch, it's very low jeweled. Um, anyway, look at, I think it's a seven jewel. Anyway, uh, you look at to make sure you see the pivots sticking out. So look at both plates, make sure both pivots are sticking out and make sure the, the uh, plate you put in there is down. So got a little leftover Rodico I saw in the back that must have when I took the Rodico off, it must have sliced off or something. So I took the Rodico off and I was at this point in time hoping that there was an extra Rodico stuck in there, but I remember not taking the Rodico off, the big chunk of Rodico. So <coughs> so there we go. So now that movement is pretty much together. I haven't tightened all of the plates completely yet. Um, I want to make sure this thing is uh, operating well before I tighten everything. So uh, they're tight, but not tighten completely. The other thing is I want to make sure that uh, I'm protecting the fourth wheel pivot so I don't want to put that down in a mat and have that bend but there um, but the center wheel pivot sticking out where the hour wheel goes on uh, usually rides the watch up high enough to protect that uh, that pivot. So here I found the uh, the pallet fork. I had a listing in my lift sitting there in my little tray. Um, I'd already done work on the um, on the main on the uh, the balance cock and the balance uh, previous. Um, so I don't show any work in this video, but I did all the work on that previously, so I'm not too concerned about that. It was ready to rock and roll. So here I'm putting the pallet fork back in. I'm trying to use the back of my hand to help uh, focus, which is good. So. Whenever you look at your hand close up, it looks pretty scary. So I see a little hair there, but it's part of my hand. It's not part of the pallet fork, so <laughs> which is a good thing. And again, you want to make sure your pallet fork is nice and clean. Uh, the jewels on the end are clean. And I'm going to put a bit of Mobius uh, oil on the end of those, uh, on the end of the stones for the pallet fork in a second. So it's Mobius uh, 9415. Um, highly, highly recommended, and that just uh, reduces the amount of friction on the the jewel and the pallet fork and the foot on the escapement. So, so it reduces the friction, which I've found is uh, really in, improves the amplitude of the watch in general because you're you don't have the friction holding that pallet fork from flipping left and right um, when you put that uh, lubricant on. I believe I show a picture of this lubricant in a second. So. So here I'm putting the pellet fork in uh, and making sure that uh, it's in the lower pivot hole and I'm going to put the bridge, the pellet fork bridge in place now. Um, this can be tricky. Uh, you need to use a, a toothpick to hold that bridge down while you're screwing things in, uh, w which is recommended. In this case, the, uh, the pellet fork bridge fit, on, fit in quite easily and, and there was no real, real issue with it popping up. 
um, as I put it in. Some of them, they're not as good, and some of them float a bit, and you have to use a uh, piece of pegwood or a, uh, or a toothpick just to hold, keep the bridge down a bit. And again, you're not pushing hard on that, you're just pushing very lightly on that to make sure it stays in place. So because putting a pallet fork in is not that exciting, I decided to speed the video up here a bit. So I'm putting the, uh, the bridge on top here, uh, very carefully lining that up and lining the uh, pivot up with that. And then I'll be putting the screws in place. Now that pallet fork kept in place nicely, so or the bridge kept in, in its place very nicely. So here I'm screwing that in, um, but I do decide to get a toothpick out, as you can see, to make sure that stays down and doesn't pop up and then I test the back of the pallet fork to also make sure that there is no issue there um, and then screw that plate in there because the first one's in I don't have to worry about it so here I'm touching the pallet fork again there's my Mobius 9415 oil 9415 which I or actually yeah 9415 which I described earlier um, and then I'm oiling putting that 9415 on the end of the pallet fork jewels and a couple of the feet of the escapement. Now what I need to do is make sure when I put pressure on that uh, on that uh, when I wind the watch up here so I'm winding the watch up here um, I find it didn't hook right away when I started winding it and I just kept going in circles and I was thinking I gotta take this whole thing apart again but then I kinda turned it upside down and then found that it was winding so it hooked so I ended up putting a bit of pressure on that and here I've uh, I'll show you the uh, pallet fork in action so I just squeeze that into my Myers number 58 movement holder the world's greatest movement holder and as you can see that pallet fork is snapping nicely back and forth which is good that's what you want you want a nice firm snap of the pallet fork because that's going to push the impulse jewel on the uh, pocket watch left and right which will give it the uh, the actual power it needs. And here's a nice close up of the snapping here. So you'll see that snap back and forth. I just give it a little touch with my screwdriver and then it, then it goes the rest of the way and it locks and releases and locks and releases. So, so that was very, very good. That worked well. So there we go. That's the pallet fork snap test. So I recommend doing that to make sure that, that the power is going from the mainspring all the way to the uh, pallet fork. Now I just had to do it again. I had to do the snap test once again for you after I had wound it up nicely. And see if I can do this. There it goes. And this time I'm using a pair of uh, twe or tweezers. So brass tweezers. So probably better to use brass tweezers than a screwdriver. But if you're just lightly touching it. So now that I've got it done, I'm tightening up, making sure that that screw is tight um, on the main plate. And it was. So and I'm tightening up the screws on the uh, pallet fork bridge to make sure that they're also very tight. So, or tight enough. So there we go. That's nice and tight and I've snapped that pallet fork back and forth again to make sure there's no issue with the pivots and all good and loving pivoting. Now comes the super exciting part of the whole video and this is where I uh, put the mainspring back in so I'm holding the mainspring here um, with, the, with the balance dangling. I've pushed the pallet fork over to the uh, inner inward direction. And so now I've got to put the, uh, the uh, balance in and then rotate it so that the impulse jewel fits into the mouth of that pallet fork. So you see me rotating it into position. I think I failed a few times at this and eventually it worked. So it's, it's an art to do this properly. Um, as long as many as I've done, I've, I've I don't know if I've ever done it perfectly the first time because it's hard. You've got to align that balance in with that lower jewel, um, and then you have to make sure that the pivots is in the right jewel, and you have to make sure that the pellet fork is accepting the impulse jewel on the correct side. And if none of that works, then you got to take it all apart and do it again. Um, uh, you can get over not over banking but it's kind of like an over banking because if that pallet fork is on the wrong side of that impulse jewel then it will then the jewel will will hit the side of the pallet fork and not the mouth and it will bank 
um, and then you've got a problem. So here I'm pushing the pallet fork back again and making sure I've got a good enough angle for entry and let's try that again and see if I can get this thing actually ticking. Usually it will move a little bit if you've got it in the right place and start ticking. So I'm not sure if it did this time, but um, I just move it a bit with my thumb to see if I've got any action here with the uh, bridge. Uh, something seems to be, nope, see you see that bouncing there? When it bounces like that, that's the impulse jewel bouncing against the side of the pallet fork. So I failed miserably again. So now I've got to take this bounce out again. Um, taking the balance out can be tricky as well. In this case, I think I grab another screwdriver and and uh, and give myself a hand doing it. Because I, I sometimes you need to just lift that balance up a bit, um, and I don't trust that I did it properly. So I'm not sure if this worked. Oh, I got a little bit of action there. No, I have it going now, which is nice. Um, I thought I used two screwdrivers on this one here, but maybe I didn't. So there we go. It's ticking. I haven't put the screw in yet. Got to make sure it's ticking nicely this before you put that screw in because uh, you want to make sure that the pivots for the upper and lower bounce staff are actually in the jewels so you don't have an issue there. So I've done that. Again, I'm using the toothpick to hold down the balance uh, bridge uh, just so it doesn't pop up while I'm putting pressure down on the... Uh, on this. So the trick here though is if you have the end shake has to be absolutely perfect. So there shouldn't be an issue with end shake here because I didn't have to do anything with the uh, pivots and the balance. So so it's running nicely. There's no problem there at all. Um, so I've got myself a running movement which is nice. So that's uh, pretty much 80% of the job done. Um, casing it, uh, putting the hands back on, putting the face back on, um, things like that are coming next, uh, but the working movement is success. There's the tum, the tum. Now I check the watch for magnetism. You see it's moving just ever so slightly. Well, I ended up demagnetizing the watch because of that. I've got a couple of demagnetizers, but uh, you kind of put it in the demagnetizer and you move it slowly away uh, from the demagnetizer uh, to about a foot and a half and then it'll demagnetize the watch and when you put the uh, the magnet back on you don't have an issue so here I'm looking for the uh, the actual um, screws for the uh, for the face so I can put that watch running on the mat like this because there's nothing sticking up on that side uh, I'm trying to put the uh, cannon pinion back here uh, what I do is I put the minute wheel down then I put the cannon pinion on, I look downward and make sure the teeth are meshing properly as I push down. Uh, and I think in this case, I'll show the work here, but in this case I pushed down and they weren't meshing properly. So I was like, okay, that's not going to work. So pushing it more is not going to help you. So, and then moving that gear, I probably could have moved the gear with, uh, with a bench, bench key, but I decided I'll pull the cannon pinion back up again. And you see I'm pu putting pressure on that as I pull up, but being very careful about not disturbing the watch too much as I do that. And I'm using the full flat surface of the mat to push that down um, just, in, just to make sure that uh, the, the bridge or the, on the other side uh, doesn't get undue stress. Now this, is, this cannon pinion was actually pretty easy to put on. It wasn't a, a really hard job to push that down. And I'm using my tweezers to do this because there's a groove in the cannon pinion that uh, uh, on this one here, which is really nice to grab with the tweezers. Uh, some cannon pinions are not like that; they're kind of slippery. The older, the br old British ones are, are uh, hell to get out. Um, I've had to actually pop them out or use uh, hand removers in the bottom of it. So, so there we go. That popped down nicely, and I didn't have to adjust the cannon pinion here at all to tighten it up a bit. Uh, it worked perfectly. Uh, so there we go. So that's the watch movement uh, all together. Now the next job here is to um, find a dial washer. So I've got a bunch of dial washers here, a kit of dial washers which is pretty handy. Different sizes. I think that was an S12 I pulled out here uh, which I ended up using. Um, anyway the dial washers um, they push down on that hour wheel 
Uh, so when the face goes on, the face actually pushes down on that hour, hour wheel, which keeps the wheel uh, downward, which keeps uh, makes ensures that the uh, that that hour wheel, uh, the teeth engage with the minute wheel uh, pinion. So the minute wheel pinion and the hour wheel pinion need to engage. So if that face is loose and the watch is facing downward, the face is facing downward. Is there's a chance without that without that uh, washer in there that the hour wheel would pop up and then you would not have the teeth engaging uh, with that uh, pinion on the minute wheel. So it's kind of important to have that uh, that particular uh, washer in there. So I always, this did not come with a washer, so I, I put one in. Here I'm bending the washer just a bit to give it a U. And when you put that in, the U is, the bottom of the U is facing downward against the uh, the hour wheel not upward so it's not the other way so it's downward that's how this works and that puts more pressure on the center so now I'm just going to line up my my uh, my uh, what are they called there my jobby doohickeys <laughs> might as well have a little laugh so here I'm making sure that the uh, fourth wheel pivot is sticking through the hole for the seconds hole um, and I'm, I'm lining up the dial feet is what I wanted to say so and I'm going to loosen the screws here to make sure that to allow the dial feet to slide down and then tighten it up and I'll do that to the other one and now you can see my nasty little fingers touching that dial well I had to clean the dial again and again and again because I had my fingers in there and I really should have put my gloves on and done it with gloves on so I wouldn't have to re-clean that dial over and over again so so you want to make sure you have gloves on for this. This is not a high-end pocket watch, though, so it's it's uh, not a high-end at all. So it's uh, just a old pocket watch. So if this was a, like a 23 jewel pocket watch, I'd be holding this with gloves on. But I'm not too concerned about this. Like I said, the old days, the guys didn't wear gloves. So as much as people like to say that no, you gotta not have any fingerprints here and blah blah blah, um, I think that. Uh, the old guys repairing pocket watches without gloves on is a testament to the uh, the lack of revenue in the glove industry, <laughs> I'll say. So, but the watch is running nicely right now, as you can see. So here I'm uh, trying to figure out how to case this watch. Usually I'm not as stupid as I tend to be right now, so I'm looking at this thinking: Does this go this way or does this go the other way? Uh, the important part here is I'm trying to keep my fingers away from the balance because when people are playing holding the watch um, it's often they'll foul the balance by holding it on the side and then keeping their fingers where the balance is so I'm having a bit of uh, brain fart here happening where I'm going well how come this doesn't come in like this because because you don't case a watch like that you idiot so I think I touched the balance as you can see so I broke my own rule so but I am holding that movement very lightly to make sure I don't have any problems here so so I'm, then I finally figure out that, uh, that I'm a complete idiot and I need to actually turn this thing around the other way. I'm like, okay, don't be such an idiot. So uh, here I find you, you, what you do is you push the movement in nicely like this. You line up the uh, stem. So I, can, I need to get that movement out again and make sure the stem is lined up. And it wasn't lined up th at that time. So, And I'm not even sure if it's lined up there. So, and I think I touched the balance again with the edge of the uh, case. You idiot. Just keep your fingers away from it. So, is that lined up there? I think it is. Yeah, let's get this watch moving again. There we go. It's ticking again, but it's not ticking with great amplitude. So, I probably need, need to run it some more. Tend, when you stop these old watches, they tend to <coughs> not want to go again. <laughs> so, there we go. So now I'm putting the screws in here. Now this one only had one screw, so I've got to go hunt for another screw. I didn't show that in the video, but the the, the case screw that's on the upper side near the uh, crown and stem, that screw needs to be replaced. I mean, the stem will hold it in place, uh, and so will the, uh, the actual crystal um, and the back plate will hold it in place as well. But I really want to want to uh, replace that, that, uh, that screw or put a new screw in there. So there we go. So that works well. I'm turning that, as you can see. Um, it's in the setting mode, I believe, because I pushed it. Or am I winding it? No, I'm actually winding it right now. 
So there we go. It's wound, it's running, it's working. Now it's time to put the hands in. So I've decided to put the back cover on lightly um, as I line up my hands, but I'm going to rotico the crap out of the face here. So, so it's uh, this rotico is amazing. It doesn't have to be super clean rotico to do the face, but I think I had an older piece of rotico and said, let's get the clean piece out so I don't add dirt to the face. So what you do is you rotate the face slightly um, in the light, and you can see if there's any fingerprints or any anything left over. Um, and I think you can see in the upper camera, I found a better piece of Rotico that I had. And I will take this piece of Rotico, stretch it out. So you stretch that out and you fold it over. So it, it in fact cleans the Rotico by doing that. Um, and then you, as you can see, I'm st I stretched it out, I folded it over. And now I'm going to rub this, uh, rub the crap out of the face here to get rid of uh, all things dirty. Now, see, I put my finger on the thing again. I'm like, why am I continuously putting my finger on this dial? So this dial has a few cracks on it, but they're just age surface cracks in the porcelain. Um, and really, it gives a watch some personality. It's not worth taking a vintage watch like this and trying to get rid of those cracks. You might as well just buy a brand new pocket watch without cracks. So, and I'm as you can see in the upper left hand or upper right hand video I'm working all of the stuff out of this dial here so all the dirt away from the dial now I'm putting the case back on and I've got to line those hands up now so a little more dial work here uh, when you're working the dial be careful not to stick the rotico in where the hole is where the second hand is um, because you can bend that pivot so you got to be very careful as you're working that also, don't press too hard because uh, sometimes that subdial is soldered in, and you could push the subdial right out of the main dial. So you don't want to to uh, push too hard on that. Um, I make sure I got the right edges. I'm looking at it again at an angle, so you can see a glare off the face, and the glare off the face will let you know whether you've uh, whether you've done the right job or not here. So, and I'm just cleaning the crap out of this watch. So. It's getting more love and care than I've ever given any other pocket watch, I think. So, Alan, there you go. I th hopefully you're pretty happy. So, <clears throat> there we go. Um, and I'm done with that. Now I'm going to put those hands back on. Uh, again, uh, you line the hands up. Uh, you have to line them up so they're not too, too low or too high. The hour hand has got to be able to be high enough to go. That's a lot of words. It has to be able to go over the seconds hand. So you have to push that down enough that your that the pip I'll call it for the uh, for the pipe pip pipe for the uh, minute hand is available to attach the minute hand, but it's not. And I'm lining the hands up right now to be at 12 o'clock because I'm anal retentive that way. So I just take that and I'll push that down nicely um, and make sure that it's uh, all the way down. So I'm pressing it pretty hard to make sure that it's down nicely and once it's down like that I look at it to make sure it's uh, clearing and so I'm looking at it from an angle to see if I've got it high enough to go over that second hand um, and in this case I'm going to lean it forward a bit as you can see me lean it forward with my hands so now it's good <coughs> and now I have to take the uh, the minute hand I have here and I'm going to put that on top now and pretty much do the same thing. And now the minute hand has to clear the hour hand and not be too high that it hits the crystal. So it's usually the tip of the minute hand is curved curved uh, around. It conforms with the curve on the crystal. So um, so when you put that in there, you, you, you basically look at the angle again and make sure you're clearing the crystal. In this case, I think it was too low, so I had to go back in, as you can see in the upper video. Um, that I'm actually angling it a bit. So holding it in my hands and playing with it so it's good from all angles. It's flat, it's angled right. 
and then <coughs> ultimately it's when it spins around that's the test that it actually works so and there we go I just didn't show I guess me pushing in that uh, seconds hand but there's the watch running and thanks for watching my video hope you enjoyed it